All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's IQIM seminar. Our speaker for today is uh, Xin Xia. Um, she's a new postdoc in the group of Anuel Endres. Uh, she's formerly at uh, CU Boulder, and today she'll be talking about her PhD work on precision measurements of few body physics um, in an interacting gas. Um, Xin, do you want to take it away? Yep. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Sujan, for introduction. Um, so I would like to thank all of you for attending this virtual seminar. Uh, my name is Xing Xie. I got my PhD from uh, University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, I recently joined uh, Manu Andres group at the end of this summer. And my topic for today uh, is precise calibrations of field body physics in potassium 39. And this is my PhD work. Um, and here's a photograph of our, of our experiment at JLA. Um, which we started to build around 2012 uh, and initially um, as a uh, Fermi gas machine. And this was a project led by Debbie Jing. Um, so as um, a kind of introduction to my team. Uh, so I worked with three advisors during my PhD. Uh, Debbie and Eric uh, played a very important role uh, in my early PhD study. Um, and Eric and Drun, they are the supervisors uh, for the work that I'm presenting today. Um, we have collaborated with uh, several uh, theorists on this project. We have uh, Josie Dinkel. Um, we have Josie Dinkel from JLA, who's the expert uh, of three body physics. And we have Paul Julia from Maryland, and he's the master of general scattering theories. Um, we have Jeremy Hudson and Matthew Fry, both from Derm, and uh, they came up with very fancy numerical methods for two body calculations. And here are the funding agencies. And here are some photographs of the graduate students and enterprise uh, in the lab uh, taken at different points of time. So as to uh, a motivation of this project, um, so technology-wide speaking, uh, we've been focusing on uh, like precise calibrations of uh, the scattering uh, uh, properties of atoms and molecules at very low temperatures. And for instance, in this case, uh, we can spatially separate atoms and fetch molecules, um, and we can interrogate uh, each component component uh, by uh, doing microwave spectroscopy. Um, and then we're able to calibrate this fetch wide resonance uh, with unprecedented accuracy and uh, both on uh, magnetic field and also on the binding energy of the, the molecules. So we want to we, we want to emphasize high precision in our experiment because we do benefit a lot from uh, uh, reducing the statist statistical errors and from understanding the systematic shifts. And this really help us refine those uh, modern scattering theories uh, and help us implement realistic spin characters in the interaction term. Um, and by measuring uh, the physical quantities in a trusted worthy way, uh, some new interesting physics just naturally comes out of it. Um, and especially um, when we do a species dependent comparison. So for instance, this is a discovery that we published in 2019 uh, is about a definitive deviation from Vanderbilt's universality. Uh, so what we measure here, this y axis, um, A minus over R Vanderbilt's is basically um, is associated with uh, the spatial extent um, of the three atom bound state. Um, this is for new homo nuclear systems. Um, and sometimes we refer to uh, these states are referred to as the Asimov state or the trimer state. And it turns out that this, uh, this one particular uh, fashion resonance in potassium is quite special that uh, this associated trimer state is substantially deviates from the predictions of the Venerables theory uh, represented by this gray band here. So as the outline, uh, I'll first talk about some background knowledge about two atom and three atom systems with resonance directions. And then I will introduce our uh, potassium uh, machine, uh, how we cool down potassium 39, what are the challenges. And then I will present uh, some of the, uh, some recent results on the measurement of, of FMR features uh, in potassium 39 for both repulsive and attractive interactions. And in the end, um, 
I would like to uh, use some animations to show uh, how I understand the global picture of the infrastructure and uh, uh, by um, like combining the features uh, in, in both interaction regimes. Uh, first, uh, I'll start with some uh, background knowledge, uh, not, not for experts. Um, so we know that uh, neutral atoms, uh, they interact uh, with each other through this Van der Waals force, uh, which, which is very short range uh, for the ground, ground electronic state. Um, and this R Van der Waals here is the characteristic, characteristic length scale uh, for Van der Waals potential. It's usually on the order of a nanometer. And uh, in some uh, uh, very rare cases, uh, sometimes there happens to be a very shallow balanced state near the scattering threshold. And in this case, when the, atoms, when the two atoms collide, uh, they can share some of this balanced state character. Um, and this process um, um, uh, makes the scattering of wave function, uh, it makes the face of the scattering wave function be changed uh, drastically. And effectively, it can enhance the, uh, like the, the, scatter, the correct characteristic length scale of the scattering lens makes this uh, scattering lens a much bigger uh, than our Van Waals. And we call such processes uh, resonance interactions. Um, and in the case of a flashback resonance, uh, this shadow balance state here uh, can be provided by uh, simply another scattering channel. Uh, it can be a different uh, spin state as in the case of a magnetic flashback resonance. Um, and the balance state, uh, of uh, a balanced state of this different spin state can be brought uh, to the scattering uh, uh, stretch hold here uh, by, an, by an external magnetic field. And um, when this balanced state becomes degenerate with the free atom state, um, the scattering lens here diverges. And the scattering lens can be pr uh, parameterized uh, uh, by this formula here. So the B naught is the pole uh, the position of the pole of the resonance and delta is the width of the resonance. And A greater than zero corresponds to repulsive interaction and A smaller than zero uh, corresponds to attractive interaction. And you can tell that uh, the scattering lens is a nonlinear function of the magnetic field near the unitary point, which means that if you want to go to higher scattering lens in the better resolution in magnetic field. Um, and usually, uh, such resonant interactions can give rise to uh, universal scattering uh, behaviors. And there sometimes can be uh, misunderstandings about this concept of universality. So it doesn't mean that you can uh, find the same behavior uh, in any system. Uh, there, there are still some uh, conditions that you have to meet. Um, and for cold atoms, uh, one such condition is that you have to have delocalized the wave functions which means that you need to work with uh, the very low energy limit. And uh, also that is, um, is, uh, is desirable that uh, you wanna keep the short in details of the potential negligible uh, so that the scattering lens A is the only length scale that you need to worry about. And as you can see in the later slides, uh, some of these con conditions um, actually uh, can be pretty strict. Uh, so now we look at, uh, we look at a three atom system uh, with resonant interactions. Uh, and this interaction is between each pair of the atoms. So it turns out to be a pretty interesting uh, uh, a problem. So Afimov, uh, he first proved that the scattering potential for such a, a system um, has a long range tail here. Uh, so this x-axis, the hyper radius, is basically is the overall is the overall size of the three-body system, and sometimes people call this potential the Afimov attraction. So it takes this one over r squared form, and intuitively, uh, this kind of long interaction we can understand it as a uh, kind of mediated interaction between uh, two atoms by exchanging the third by exchanging the third atom. And of course, the bound states of the potential are quantized. And the very interesting result of this one of R squared potential is that, um, so we call it scaling invariance. 
so when we rescale this hyper radius R here, um, then you can uh, see that this energy scale, uh, sorry, the energy spectrum actually can automatically uh, reproduce itself. Um, and in practice, uh, because we can't adjust uh, the potential, but what we can do is we can change the scatter lens with the help of a flashback resonance. Um, so at finite scatter lens, it's been proved that the energy levels of these f trimer states, they also have a self-similar feature. Um, there's actually a infinite number of trimer states uh, accumulating at this unitarity, um, which is not shown here. Um, and we know that um, each bound state um, is shallow word and its previous one uh, by a factor of 22.7. And this number is for uh, three identical bosons. And there's a very familiar example of this self-similarity is a set of nesting dolls. And it's worth, I think it's worth noting that um, at negative scattering lengths, uh, three atoms can be bound even, uh, you can see the three atoms can be bound even when uh, there's no shallow uh, two-body bound state here. Um, and this is kind of analogous to this mathematical structure uh, it's called bromine rings. So three rings uh, in this picture, three rings are entangled together, although each pair of the rings are not linked. Uh, so next, I would like to uh, maybe briefly uh, present an experimental platform uh, that we use to study all of these physics. Um, so here's the top view of the assembly of the vacuum. So we have two mod chambers. Uh, this, this first mod is the source mod. And the second mod is for doing sub doppler cooling. And we use a push beam. Uh, we use a push beam uh, to push the atoms from the first mod to the second mod. And then we also have a glass cell for doing the science. And here are uh, several challenges in the cooling process of potassium. Uh, one is that uh, the hyperfine uh, levels in this uh, excited state uh, are very crowded. Um, so we have to operate the mod laser um, at very high power so that we can have enough optical pumping. And at the same time, uh, we work with uh, uh, very large detunings uh, in order uh, to reduce the heating effect. And after the mod collection stage, uh, we do a sub doppler cooling uh, to get to lower temperature. Uh, we employ this uh, D1 transition uh, to, to perform this so-called gray molasses. So uh, basically how it works is that uh, we have uh, two laser frequencies different by the hyperfine splitting and these lasers form a lambda kind of configuration um, and it has a dark state and the slow atoms can get trapped in this dark state. Uh, and the dark state has much narrower line width uh, than the natural line width of potassium. And we can um, go to very low temperature, like below 10 microkelvin, uh, with about 10 to the 9 atom number at the end of this sub doppler cooling. And we know that laser cooling is usually uh, not cold enough to make degenerate gases. So we, uh, we compress the cloud in the second mod chamber, and we use a magnetic transfer uh, to move the atoms to the site cell, and then we do evaporative cooling there. Um, and here comes the second challenge um, of the cooling of the cooling process, which is the a very very small uh, S wave scattering cross section at zero magnetic field. And because potassium thirty nine has an uh, it has a a negative background scatter lens, um, it gives rise to a, a the so called Ramsauer Thompson minimum um, happens at about three hundred microkelvin. And this is the temperature uh, after we do the compression. So there's basically no evaporation going on. Um, and the solution to this is that uh, we do a, a pure optical uh, trapping to confine the atoms very tightly uh, in order to enhance the collision rate. And we also turn on a uh, uh, bias field uh, so that we can stay close to a fast resonance, resonance um, and that can help us increase the cross section. And at the end of the evaporation, uh, we can go to as low as about 10 nanokelvin 
And these are uh, kind of the conditions that we work with for the experiment. Um, and we purposely do not use a BEC um, in this experiment. And here's a picture of the sine cell, uh, which is octagon. Uh, shall I make a pause for a second and see if there are questions? I'll keep going if there are. Sure. Um, if you have questions, um, please uh, raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can ask the question. Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, maybe we can move on. So um, we did a lot of measurements on scattering physics after uh, we completed the construction of our experiment. Uh, we first uh, calibrated the flashback resonance by doing dissociation spectroscopy on flashback molecules. Uh, so we first produced molecules by uh, uh, sweeping the magnetic field adiabatically across the resonance um, to make the molecules. And this is the so-called magneto association of molecules. And there's usually a uh, very finite uh, efficiency uh, in this process. So in order to uh, separate the molecules from the, from the atoms, we have a designed microwave uh, followed by a blasting light to remove the atoms from the trap. And then uh, we can interrogate the molecules alone. Um, and after that, we apply another microwave pulse. Um, this is on a, a transition that's insensitive to B field noise. And we, uh, uh, we use this microwave to uh, dissociate a small fraction of the molecules. And then we do absorption imaging to probe uh, one of, uh, to, to probe one of the parent atoms in each molecule. And here's an image of uh, this atoms and molecule that are being separated. Here's a, a kind of a, a typical spectrum uh, that we took on pure atoms and the pure molecules. Uh, as Gaussian uh, line shape here, it represents this, uh, this free atom transition that we use uh, to calibrate our magnetic field. And there's an asymmetrical uh, spectrum here is the molecule dissociation spectrum. And uh, uh, you can extract the binding energy of the molecule, which is uh, around this threshold here. And then we repeat the spectrum at different magnetic field uh, shown as a different points here. And we can map out the, uh, we can map out the binding energies of the molecules uh, which span three orders of magnitude. Um, and we can control the B field uncertainty to within uh, like one milligauss and the uncertainty of the body energies um, is about, can be down to tens of hertz. And we play with different fitting methods. Um, um, and you can, you can tell uh, this first one is a, a universal formula of the uh, body energy is a, a function of uh, scattering lens and it agrees with the data uh, uh, very close to unitarity. And this is the, uh, the universal region for two body physics. And stepping away from this unitarity, um, we have to add an extra term to the fitting function. This A bar here is basically to account for the finite range of our uh, resonance. Sorry, the finite range of interaction potential. Um, and in order to, uh, to get all the binding energies correctly, uh, in theory, we have to introduce a multi-channel uh, a multi-channel uh, model that uh, account for the proper spin characters. Um, and this model works really well. We have a, a pretty small uh, thinning residuals. And in the end, we can extract uh, uh, the parameters that characterize this special resonance uh, from this multi-channel fit. And we can uh, locate the pole of the resonance to be within about uh, 1.4 milligauss. And this is actually two orders of magnitude improvement uh, compared to the previous experiment. Um, we think this calibration that gives us a very solid B to A conversion, um, which is pretty important uh, when we study the physics at very large scattering lengths near unitarity. Uh, so now with a, a pretty good understanding of the two body physics, uh, we can move on to uh, measure the three body 
uh, observables. Um, it's usually uh, very hard to directly probe uh, these tremor states because they are very short-lived. So people do scattering experiments instead. Um, so our experiment is, uh, so we, we prepare some samples of free atoms. We can scan uh, scattering lens along this uh, three atom scattering threshold. And we can measure a loss rate of atoms from the trap. Um, and this loss, we know that this loss process is dominated by this so-called uh, three-body recombination. So basically two of the atoms can form a deeply bound molecule state and the third one can carry away the momentum. And this, this recombination rate is goes as a to the force uh, for pairwise interactions. And at certain scattering lengths, um, we know that the iPhone trimer state, it can intersect the free atom threshold. Um, and this trimer can actually uh, uh, participate in this three body recombination process uh, by uh, acting as some intermediate product and it can greatly enhance the loss. And this process, it gives rise to a kind of modulated loss coefficient um, L3 here um, like this. And it presents, um, you can see it presents a, a loss peak uh, over here. And you can uh, tell from our data that as we go to larger and larger A, uh, this loss rate it kind of saturates due to the unitary belt. Um, and we did a systematic study of the temperature dependence of L3. Uh, so as we go to the higher temperature, um, you can kind of tell that the, the peak location is slightly uh, shift to, to the smaller scatterland side. Um, and um, you can, you can tell this trend from uh, uh, the, these black points are the extracted peak locations um, from each data set. And uh, um, you can see the trend as a function of the temperature. Um, and in order uh, to capture this finite temperature effect, we also did a thermal average on L3 in our fitting routine, and then extract the peak location, which is defined as zero temperature. And this gives the, the hollow squares here. Uh, and we think this is a true definition of this, uh, this resonance location A minus, which is indeed, uh, you can see is independent of the temperature and it agrees with the asymptotic value of this phenomenological uh, peak location. Uh, and there's uh, uh, a significance of our result is that, um, this measured A minus value, it deviates from the, the Venerable's universal prediction uh, by quite a lot. The, the prediction is the purple line here, as I mentioned um, in this introduction slide. Uh, and now we have talked about a benchmark feature for A smaller than zero. Um, and uh, this feature is uh, a quantity that people frequently measure uh, with different atomic species. Um, there are other benchmark features on the positive side, which are equally important, but they're not as much explored. Um, and in this experiment, we scan the scattering lens along this atom dimer scattering threshold, and we look at the lifetime of dimers. Um, and because uh, we have some, uh, uh, because the spin state that we work with, it suffers from spin relaxation process, our molecule, uh, there's some one body decay, one body decay uh, process of the molecule. Uh, it can break apart on its own. And we measure this, uh, uh, the background, we call it a background molecule lifetime is a function of scattering lengths. Um, and this is done with pure molecule samples. Um, and after this, we measure the molecule lifetime again uh, with atoms staying in the trap. So when the, uh, when the shallow molecule collides with an atom, uh, it can relax into a more deeply bound state and the atom can carry away the energy. Um, and this additional loss process, you can see notably, it shortens the lifetime of the molecule. Um, and at certain scattering lengths, the lifetime is especially short and this is related to, uh, there's an underlying trimer state 
uh, that merges with the, the atom dimer scattering threshold. And this trimer state, it can participate in the uh, inelastic process. And this is actually the first excited trimer state, not the ground one, because the ground one always still stays below the threshold. Um, and from the two lifetimes measurement, we can uh, extract uh, the uh, we can uh, subtract out the background and can um, obtain the, the atom dimer reaction uh, coefficient, uh, which is the beta ID here. And you can kind of see a resonance peak that's quite prominent. Um, and again, we did a systematic study uh, of the timer dependence uh, of this beta measurement. Um, and you can uh, see there's a, uh, the, peak, the peak location, it gets slightly shifted to the smaller scattering lens as we go to higher temperature. And this peak location, uh, we can extract that peak location as the black points here, it has a small trend, function of temperature. Um, and in order to uh, uh, analyze this finite temperature effect, we again, we did a summary average on beta ID in the fitting routine. Um, and we use the peak location at zero temperature as the fit parameter. Um, and this gives uh, this true definition of the atom dimer resonance location, uh, which is indeed independent of the temperature. And we're actually the first group to report this observation of this temperature dependency uh, of the atom dimer resonance. And there's another interesting uh, discovery after we uh, uh, we we uh, so after we carefully compensated for the fan temperature effect is that we found um, the width of the peak um, is actually pretty consistent with the weak, uh, sorry, consistent with the, the width of the, the triatomic resonance uh, on the negative side. Uh, so the, the atom diver resonance peak is the, uh, the pink points and the, the triatomic resonance peak width is the blue circles. Um, we think this is quite interesting because, uh, um, uh, because generally speaking, uh, this width parameter um, it cannot be deduced from uh, like the tail of this vanderbilt potential in an ab initial way um, because it has to do with the short range details of indirect potential, which can in principle it can vary dramatically across the threshold resonance, but which is not the case uh, in, in our resonance. Uh, so now we have gone through uh, a lot of technical details uh, about how we benchmark the FMOM structure. Uh, I think it'd be nice to uh, present a kind of a global picture of this FMOM structure uh, in a heuristic way. Um, so let's go through the spectrum again. Uh, so we have this horizontal line here. It represents uh, the three free atoms scattering threshold, and we rescale the scattering lengths by our Vanderbilt for a convenient unit. Um, and the positive and negative scattering lines are connected by unitarity. Um, and this blue curve, the blue curve represents the scattering threshold for a free atom plus a shallow molecule. Um, and there's a set of colored curves representing a different, branch, uh, different branches of the FML trimers. Um, and there's a fixed uh, scaling factor between uh, neighboring uh, branches of the trimers and we put them, we put them on lock scale. So this is a fixed uh, separation. And uh, the shallower the trimers are, they're more loosely bound, uh, therefore they're the bigger in size. Uh, so experiments, uh, we scan the scatter lens on the negative side and then we can observe these lost resonance peaks uh, they are related to each tremor state. Um, the peaks are located at, at A minus. And similarly, we scan the scatter lens. On the positive side, we can observe atom dimer resonance peaks, uh, which can also be re related to the, to the underlying tremor states uh, marked at A star here. Um, so, so note that we, uh, uh, so we, we rescale uh, these loss peaks, the, the, the loss coefficients, uh, by a to the fourth and a respectively, so that we can visualize, so that we can get rid of the background and we can visualize the peaks better. 
so, so Afimov, he calculated this scaling factor between uh, the different branches of the, uh, the resonances. And uh, um, in his original scenario, uh, so quickly uh, refresh it, he uses a, a zero range potential and in principle, it can hold infinite number of tremor states, which means that the tremors can be infinitely small and infinitely deep. And what this means is that this, there's, there's not a length scale um, that fixes the, the phase of this periodic structure. Um, and all these peaks can kind of move around and there are even a number of them. Um, at the same time, uh, you, you, um, uh, the, the scaling factors, of course, they stay constant. And one of the scaling factor is uh, this 22.7 is the ratio between adjacent branches. Uh, and there's another uh, scaling factor, this minus one, it relates uh, the peaks on the negative side to the peaks on the positive side. Uh, uh, for instance, this one and that one. Uh, and this is not this, uh, the same branch, it's one level higher. Um, and we only have two ratios here and there are other numbers, but I think these are the uh, most important ones. Uh, so in real systems such as cold atoms, uh, we know that zero range potential uh, is not true because we do have some length scale associated with interaction potential uh, and it can make uh, it can make this spectrum bound from below. Uh, it gives rise to a uh, some some kind of ground uh, state trimer. Um, and for this length scale, I put here is the uh, this so-called effective range parameter for a reason that I'm probably going to skip for now. And uh, I put some yellow zones here uh, representing that this FMR structure in these regions, they will be affected by the short in physics. Um, as, and this is the effect at very small scattering lengths. Um, and there's a consequence uh, of this short range physics effect is that um, the locations of the resonant peaks can be shifted. And uh, correspondingly, the scaling factors will be changed as well. Um, and there's a very interesting result uh, that comes from this uh, short range effect. You might have heard about it is the so-called Vanderbilt's universality. Uh, so basically the location of the ground triatomic resonance um, is always about uh, this F scale here is always about 10 times our Vanderbilt's. Um, and people have repeatedly observed uh, this Vanderbilt's universality in many different atomic species. Um, the, the theory prediction is this gray band here. Um, and you can see there are uh, lots of measurements with different species. And uh, the, the, the only, uh, the different, the very different one is uh, the phosphorus resonance in potassium that we work with. It substantially deviates from this um, prediction. Therefore, we, uh, we sometimes we call it not universal in a sense of a, a simple, uh, uh, a simple Venerable's prediction that cannot predict it. And this is a discovery that we published in 2019. Um, and it turns out that this is not all the story yet. There are actually more interesting things to it. So despite the very non-universal uh, nature of uh, uh, potassium-39, the, uh, the, 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 the ground trimer location, so we found that uh, there's a, uh, another discovery is that the scaling ratio in potassium, uh, which connects um, the, these two sides of the fast resonance, it turns out to be, uh, oh, this slide, sorry. It turns out to be very close to minus one. So minus one is the number predicted uh, by FMOF's very primitive theory, which is based on zero range potential. Um, and this result is actually in contrast to those species that people used to think are the most universal ones, for instance, cesium. Uh, cesium result it deviates from this minus one a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go through the details 
and explain what makes our federal residents so special. Uh, there are already some theories on that, and I think it opens up a lot of questions. Um, so I, I think I, I would like to uh, conclude my talk by again uh, bringing up some some issues from technical challenges because sometimes people may ask. So if you want to see this arch and FMR ratios, why don't you just go to these highly excited states? Um, and be, because they are, they, we know that they should be very uh, separated from the short range effects. Um, and the answer is the, the technical limitations um, that repre represented by this purple zone here. Um, and when we go to higher scattered lens, uh, we'll be limited by the finite temperature and the finite density of uh, the, the clouds. And that these effects, they usually they can introduce um, other length scale and this length scale can be comparable to, can be comparable to the scattered lens. Um, and and, uh, and these technical limit, limitations actually leave us a very limited window, like this, this white zone here, for seeing this original, original FMF scaling. And we're kind of hoping that uh, in our collaboration with uh, Code Atom Laboratory at JPL, uh, we'll be able to make a coded cloud uh, in micro, in micro, sorry, in microgravity uh, environment, uh, which will allow us to access these uh, these excited states, such as the one over here. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you again for uh, attending the talk, uh, and uh, I'll take some questions if there are some questions. We have a question from Professor Kimball. Uh, yes, it's spectacular measurements. I have some memory that the FMR physics can actually lead to uh, uh, mo molecules that are not just trimers. Is it possible to have pairs of trimers bound, to have four atoms bound, is it only triplets for the whole FMOF story? Yeah, there are some four body bound states. Um, um, they're not trimers, but they're also part of the FMOF theory. Um, so we purposely, the, uh, we purposely lower the density of our sample so that we don't see uh, like, um, like higher body effects than three body. Uh, just to uh, reduce the uh, like the systematics, like due to like uh, condensing, like sometimes the BEC, the, the, the atoms can start to interact so strongly uh, that there's some density effects that that's kind of hard to understand. But I, I do know that uh, there's some very excellent work by Innsbruck uh, group that they observed the tetrachromer state. I uh, still is looking at the loss of the atoms. And generically, those higher number of bound atoms are more weakly bound? Can they ever become uh, more strongly bound in the FMOF triplets? So I think the, I've seen this uh, a prediction of the, the, uh, the spectrum of the tetramer state. Uh, I think the prediction of uh, uh, like two tetramer states associate with each trimer state and they like, like they roughly stay below the trimer state. So there are two tetramers here and two tetramers here and, and two tetramers like attached to each branch of the FMOF state. That's what I remember. But they're okay. very close to the, the trimer states. I see. Is there some universality associated with going, you know, three, four, five, infinity? Uh, I think people can do four and a five. Uh, I think more than that, I think it's, uh, I guess it's getting like exponentially difficult to calculate. Okay, thank you. They're beautiful measurements again. Thanks. All right, we are open to take further questions. Um, so I have a question from my end. Um, so you had this nice summary plot where you um, charted um, results of this uh, FMOF bound state length scale from previous measurements um, and then yours comparing various species. 
Um, could you talk a little bit about what was on the x-axis of that plot? You had this parameter s res, if I recall correctly. Um, oh, okay. So what is that and why is that the <laughs> distinguishing parameter between various species and measurements? Yeah, 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 I understand, yeah. So the s res parameter, um, so the way I understand is that, so if you have larger s res, then that means the, the scattering channel is like more dominant dominated by just a single spin uh, state. So for us, we have S res about one, which means there, uh, there are more than one spin states participating in the scattering. We have actually four channels, uh, sorry, five channels that we have to include in our calculation. So there's a, um, I don't have a super like intuitive way to uh, explain it. But like the, the, this is like a single venerables for like cesium, you, you need a single venerables potential to do the calculation for potassium and lithium, you have to do uh, this hyperfine interaction of like maybe five different spin states in the calculation. And from very narrow ones, uh, it's get, it's, it gets more complicated, I think. Interesting. Um, uh, another question I had was um, about, um, you know, the main technical advancements you had to make. Um, so you talked about this um, two orders of magnitude improvement um, in precision um, of the uh, Beschbach resonance um, early on. Um, could you talk a little bit about what enabled um, that advance? Uh, there, uh, so there, there are lots of things. Um, so we uh, uh, it's mostly just uh, you know every little thing in experiment. We make the laser super stable, we make temperature and the B field super stable, so that we can take many points over like long period of time, and then we can uh, reduce the the statistical errors uh, by doing that. And also we take into like systematic effects in the measurements. For instance, we have this confinement shift of these funny energies due to the uh, the harmonic trap. Of the op from the optical trap, and we can uh, calculate that. We can compensate for that, and it makes the um, it makes the, the fitting uh, more accurate. Yeah, because but questions? also like sorry, sorry. Also, we have this very excellent uh, a couple channel model from Paul Julian and Jeremy Hudson. Um, and they uh, they play with this uh, short range parameter, this you know, single triplet scatter lines and fit of data, and they had uh, the best model. So that also contributes to this result. Are there any further questions from the audience? Um, I had one final question. So you had also had a, a plot where you showed um, uh, this three body loss coefficient, I think L3 you called it, um, versus the mm -hmm. um, length scale. Um, so the, the, the theory you described was basically, you know, what went into this the solid line um, um, fitting uh, the resonance here, is, is, that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, so the fitting is a thermal average of L3. So we know the analytical form of L3 at different temperature, uh, at different collision energy, and we can do a thermal average by using temperature measured uh, from experiment. Uh, and in, in this analytical form of L3, uh, we have this unknown uh, parameters, which is the peak location and the peak width. Um, and we use these two parameters as the fitting parameter, and then we can extract uh, this uh, A minus, which is defined for zero temperature. And it's, uh, I think it's a interesting thing is that uh, because the L3, it, we can also put a kind of arbitrary amplitude uh, to make it match the data, but it, this, this arbitrary amplitude is always one for us. This amplitude is, uh, 
is related to the density of the cloud. The loss rate is the L3 times the density square. Um, so which means, um, I think the sanity check that we, we know the density of our cloud very well. It's kind of a, a, a subtlety in the, in the fitting process. All right, last call for questions. Right. If not, um, let's thank our speaker, Shin, again. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk and amazing results. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, hope to see you in the next IQIM seminar. Uh, bye, everyone.